In the beginning, God. A being so immense, so powerful, full of all wisdom, full of all knowledge, that his very existence extends beyond the fathomable realms of time. From eternity past to eternity future, he's the author of all things that are known, can be known, or ever will be known. He's the very source of all things that are. Before the creation of time and space, before the first light of the stars, before the very foundations of the universe, God was there. In that void, before planets were created, God existed. Before any living creature was formed, before every, any living thing took its first breath, before any heart began to beat, or before any single thought was had by a living being, God reigned. Omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent, present everywhere at once, God reigned as the supreme sovereign. Unchallenged in every way, entirely self-existent within the Trinity, even before the foundations of the time, the great I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, perfectly content, needing nothing, desiring nothing, and lacking nothing. And then, in a moment unlike any other in the span of time, this magnificent, glorious, sovereign God decided to extend His radiance and His majesty and his glory with a word bringing forth the universe. And in six days, he created all that we know. He chose to create man. He breathed the breath of life into his lungs and he gave him a purpose and the highest honor that any creature could ever or would ever have a relationship with almighty God. The privilege of knowing God. If you're sitting here tonight as a Christian, you've been graced with the knowledge of this mighty, majestic, sovereign God. He formed you in your mother's womb. He sovereignly declared where you would live and how you would look. The very hairs on your head were numbered. You have life because the God of all the universe chose to give you life. You didn't deserve it. In fact, you've proven over and over again, if you're honest, that you've taken it for granted. You've not honored God for the life that he's given you the way you should. And at times, if you're honest, you'll have to admit that you've been consumed by the ways of the world more often than the ways of God. You've probably given yourself to the very things that God hates. And instead of being consumed with the majesty and grandeur of God, you've probably proven over and over that you've been consumed by your own passions and your own desires. And yet, this God who created you, knowing that you would do all these things, still gave you life. If you're a believer here this morning, He sent Christ to die for you. You, the very one who would deny his sovereignty at times, who would reject his majesty at times, who would reject and deny his splendor, who would take it for granted. Still, he sent his beloved son to die for you so that you would have life and be made new as a believer. He did that so that you would be washed clean of the filth of the world, so that you would be able to have life and not death despite how you've treated him, so that you would be rescued from the pit of hell, which you deserved because of your sin. What an incredible God. What an incredible God. He looked at you knowing how You would reject him, how you would defy him, how you would choose your own 
lusts and passions over him, and he still gave you life. What a merciful God. What a benevolent and beautiful God that he would look upon you, the sinner, and choose to lavish his love on you through Christ. The sovereign God of the universe who needed nothing, who desired nothing, and yet he desired to make you and then to redeem you. What a God. Worthy. Worthy to be praised. My aim this evening is not for you to walk away tonight thinking that that was some great sermon or to attempt to awe you with any kind of clever rhetoric or fancy cliches or eloquent speech. I'm not known for any of those things anyway. My aim tonight is very simply to give you this, to present to you something of the majesty, the holiness, the magnanimity of Almighty God. Far too many churches, far too many professing Christians approach God far too casually. Forgetting who He is and who we are as if God were just one of us. I'll tell you tonight what we are in desperate need of. It isn't a new political system. It isn't new laws. It isn't more conversations from the pulpit. It isn't more coffee shop meetings. What we desperately need today is a resurrected realization of the majesty of God. We need to go back to the fundamentals of who God is so we can understand who we are. He's the great creator, and we are dust. We are the creation made in his image, but made to worship and glorify him. So my task this evening is not a light one. I don't think that we can speak of God as though he were one of us. Tonight, I would suggest that we walk on holy ground. And I would suggest that as we continue tonight, that we tread lightly, dear Christian, that we tread lightly and that we tread reverently. We could spend a lifetime, a thousand lifetimes, studying the scriptures and only begin, I think, to scratch the surface of who God truly is. His great character, His holiness, and we've just got a very short time tonight. So my plea to you, dear Christian, is that you would open your eyes to the word of God, that you would prepare your hearts tonight for the work of the Holy Spirit. And let's look together, albeit briefly, at who God is as he reveals himself in the pages of Scripture for the rest of the evening. Well, how does this all connect to the Puritans? That's a very simple answer. The Puritans had a sense of how great God is. And this is what I think the church has lost today. The Puritans knew that God was a holy God. But Christians today are largely trifling with God because they don't know what the Puritans knew. I want to look tonight at six brief places in Scripture. We're going to bounce around just a little bit just to show us something of who this holy, mighty, majestic God is. I want us to reattune our minds and our hearts away from the irreverent, tainted filth of the world, away from the casualness that so many have towards God, and let us recover the attitude which the Puritans had because they knew God. Let us get back a holy reverence for a holy God. There's no better place to start than Genesis. We know the story. God made Adam and placed him in the garden. And in verses 16 to 17 in chapter 2, we read this. It says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, 
From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. In the next chapter, we see the fall. So now Eve is on the scene. She's talking with Satan. And Satan says in chapter 3, 5, he says, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so what does she do? She eats of the fruit that is forbidden, and she gives it to her husband, Adam, who's with her. Which, by the way, should have slapped that fruit out of her hand quicker than she could blink. But no, he didn't. He abdicated his God-given role to lead, and he let go of his fear of God in that moment. And at that moment, they gave into the very temptation that, I would argue, cast Satan out of the heavens, the desire to be like God. They forgot who they were and who God is. Their disobedience revealed the sinfulness, the audacity, the arrogance of that moment as they chose to disobey the very God that had created them and all that they knew. The moment they ate that fruit, they broke fellowship with God and sin entered the world. They thought they could be like God. And what was the consequence? Was God gracious? Absolutely. He could have just struck them down. He would have been just to do so. Instead, he only cursed them. What did it cost? It cost them everything. To the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your pain and conception. and pain, you will bear children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you and pain you will eat of it all the days of your life. And you know the rest of the story. Adam and Eve crossed the line. They served a holy God. And at that moment, they treated God as though he were just one of them. Another man with an opinion that could be obeyed or ignored. They forgot who God was. And their sin caused them to be banished from the Garden of Eden. And every person since then has felt the consequence of that sin. Jonathan Edwards says of the sin in the Garden, he says... The first sin committed by Adam and Eve was a high-handed rebellion against God. The greatest sin of which creatures could be guilty. Are you, dear Christian, sitting here this evening rebelling against a holy God? Like Adam and Eve, are you questioning God's word? Are you considering a path that you know you shouldn't be going down? Beloved, don't make the mistake that Adam and Eve made. They rebelled against God. And then they dared to hide themselves when what they should have done is cast themselves at the feet of God, pleading for His mercy. I have no doubt that some of you tonight need to cast yourselves at the foot of the cross and ask for mercy. And He's faithful to give it. But remember from Genesis, dear Christian, that there is a cost to rebelling against a holy God. We need to never forget that. The second place we see something of God's grandeur, something of the consequences of how we treat God is still in Genesis. You realize we don't even get out of the first book yet before there's problems. We're in Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3. You go to Genesis chapter 6, you know the story well too. The flood. Chapter 6, verse 11 through 13, listen to what it says. It says, now the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. There's two things I want to point out here. The first one is 
this, that God does not overlook evil. There's not a single soul alive today that will escape judgment. There's no such thing as an unseen sin. There's no person that will get away with sin in the end. God may appear to overlook sin for a time, but a day of judgment is coming. The people around Noah had over a hundred years to repent. I mean, the very presence of the building of the ark itself was reason enough. And yet they persisted in evil and unbelief. They had no thought of God. The people on the earth of that day, they rejected him, they denied him, they mocked him, and in their evil hearts, they fought against him. But he is God. And nothing prevails against God. And their due penalty was their utter destruction. And so what about the sin in your own life? Are you neglecting God? Even denying Him in the way you're living your life? Every sin you commit, He sees. Every time you have hate in your heart, lust in your heart, every time you swell up with pride, He sees. The penalty for sins of man in the times of Noah was death. And still today, the wages of sin is death. God is not a God, dear belovedly Christians. He's not a God to be taken lightly. He's not a man like you and I. And he's a holy God. The second lesson from Noah is just this, that those who live by faith live indeed. Charles Spurgeon rightly said that it was by faith Noah escaped the flood. By unbelief, the rest were drowned. Don't play with God. You see, the Puritans understood that you couldn't escape such a grand God. They understood that. You either die by him or you live by him, but he isn't to be taken for granted. You either cast yourself on his mercy found at the foot of the cross or the weight of his wrath will crush you. God demonstrated in that one event that he and he alone is the sovereign one. He killed every living being except no one knows with him. Do you understand that? But he also demonstrated that there's love and there's mercy and grace for those who have faith in him. The third place I want to spend the most of our time tonight is in the book of Job. You want to go ahead and turn to the book of Job. There's perhaps no greater book that displays God's absolute sovereignty, God's great majesty or God's absolute authority over all of creation and man than the book of Job. Through the story of Job, we see God's sovereignty asserted above man's will in every way as Job is humbled by God's power and control over all things. You probably know the story. The first chapter, it gives us a unique view of God dealing with creation, with his creation. Starting in verse 6 of chapter 1, we read this. You can put your eyes on it. Now, it was the day that the sons of God came to stand before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them. And Yahweh said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Then Yahweh said to Satan, Have you set your heart upon my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And Satan answered Yahweh and said, Does Job fear God without cause? 
Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? But send forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Then Yahweh said to him, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only do not send forth your hand towards him. So Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh. We're told that Job is a blameless man. That he's upright, that he feared God, that he turns away from evil. Now, I want you to notice in verse 8 here that it's God who calls Satan's attention to Job. He says, have you considered my servant Job? There's no indication that Satan ever even knew who Job was. What does that tell us? God was in absolute control of this entire scenario. And so why is it so often that we act as though God isn't in control? As though somehow we can mess up God's plan or that some things are so bad that God couldn't possibly be in control. I think we've forgotten what it means that God is sovereign. He's not just sovereign over some things. He's sovereign over all things. God was and is in absolute control. I just want to point out something that gets overlooked here in this part of Scripture. If you'll notice, Satan did not attempt to push back against God. God said, this far and no further, and that was the end of it. Even Satan still knows who God is. Do you know who God is? Job's a unique book because it gives us small glimpses of just the absoluteness of the commands and decrees of God, specifically in the life of man in the way no other book really does. But not only that, we see God's greatness also in Satan's unquestioned submission to the boundaries God sets in his life. Satan is not God's opposite equal, he's a creature created in full submission to the boundaries the living God gives him. And so this is the question for you this evening. Are you submitted to this holy, majestic, and absolutely sovereign God? Even Satan walked away in absolute obedience here. And he hates God, but he knows who God is. How terrible a thought to think that believers who love God are less obedient than Satan. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So how is it that today the demons shudder before a holy God when so many pressing, professing believers treat God with such familiarity? Just think about that. Do the demons fear God more than you? I pray that's never true in your life or mine. So we see God here in all of his authority displayed in Job, even in just this opening chapter. But then what about Job? What about the rest of the book? And we won't go through all of the book of Job. You'll be happy to hear. But do we see anything else of God's grandeur, of God's authority? Can we learn anything else about this magnificent majestic God of ours that the Puritans knew so well. Well, turn with me to chapter 42. We'll skip a few chapters. Chapter 42. Verse 5 and 6. This is Job. He says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I reject myself and I repent in dust and ashes. What in the world is going on? 
We've just been told that there's no man like Job anywhere else on earth. God himself has said, this is a righteous man. And now we get to chapter 42 and Job is in dust and ashes repenting. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Job met the living God. You see, although Job was a righteous man, he still thought that he could speak to God the way he pleased. He presumed upon the blessings of God such that he thought God owed him an explanation for all that was happening. God, tell me, why all this suffering? Job forgot who he was because he forgot who God is. And this, dear friend, is the problem in the church Today, the Puritans had a fear of God because they studied God. They meditated in his word and they were by no means perfect, but they learned whom God was and they aimed not to forget it. But here, Job does forget. And what's the response from God that causes such a reply in Job? I mean, what is it that he has heard that causes him to say, I reject myself. I repent in dust and ashes. You see, Job's been complaining and he's been complaining and he's been complaining. And if you don't know, he's lost his family. He's lost his finances. He's lost his fame in the land and he's grumbling. He's lost his health. And he never blamed God, but he's at the point where he's practically begging to die. He clearly expects an answer. Do you get that? Expects an answer from God. He thinks he deserves an answer. And now he's about to discover the difference between God and man. Turn with me back just a couple chapters to 38. Verse 1. This is where Job meets his maker. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you make me know. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstones when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? And God keeps coming. He's unrelenting. Verse 12, have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place? Verse 16 and 18 through 18, have you entered the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you carefully considered the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. How would you like to be Job? (laughs) Chapter 39, verse 1. Do you know the time the mountain goat gives birth? Verse 19 and 39. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Verse 26, is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings towards the south? Oh, and then we come to chapter 40. Chapter 40, and we read this. Then Yahweh answered Job and said, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer. Then Job said, answered Yahweh and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I respond to you? I place my hand over my mouth. Once I've spoken, I will not answer even twice. And I will add nothing more. Dear friends, this is your God. This is the God of the universe. 
The God who created all things, rules all things, guides all things, and he takes counsel from no one. Job found out who God truly was that day. I'm just wondering if some of you need to find out who God truly is this day. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that can come against the sovereign purposes of God. The Puritan Matthew Henry said, The root of religion is the fear of God reigning in the heart, a reverence of His majesty, a deference to His authority, and a dread of His wrath. Now someone might dare to say after all of that, Well, but Nathaniel, that was the God of the Old Testament. I kind of want to hit people with the Bible when they say that. (laughs) But fine. Just turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 17. New Testament. Jesus' transfiguration. What about those closest to Jesus? I mean, they were with the incarnate Christ, the living God in the flesh. If anyone could have a casual attitude, a familiar attitude with God, it would be those who walked with him in the flesh. Right? And if there was any example that we could and should learn from, surely it would be from them. Matthew 17, 1 through 7, it says, And six days later, Jesus brought with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three booths here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Some of you need to be terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, get up and do not be afraid. These were the very men who walked with Jesus day in and day out. And when they were confronted with the glory of Christ and the word of God from heaven, they fell on their faces in worship. How is it that the apostles responded in such a way? And yet, if you look at the average Christian today, they think that when Jesus comes back, they're going to walk up to him, punch him in the shoulder and say, what's up, my dude? Sir, if that's your God, you don't know God. No, they will fall on their faces before a glorious king, a holy God. So, dear Christian, do you treat Christ with reverence? Do you walk on holy ground before God? Or do you treat God as though he were just a man? I'm not asking what you profess with your lips. I don't care what you tell me. I want to know what your life looks like. Do you know the living God? Turn with me to Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 5. Verses 1 through 11. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself. With his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land while it remained unsold? 
Did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived in this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And a great fear came over all who heard it. The young man got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there was an elapse, an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband at the door, they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last And the young man came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And a great fear came over the whole church and over all those who heard these things. I wonder if a great fear comes over you tonight when you hear these things. Or does the death of Ananias and Sapphira somehow bother your sensibilities? Would you say, well, it was just a little lie. It wasn't fair. It didn't hurt anybody. Well, it hurt Ananias and Sapphira. (laughs) But you see, they were trifling with a holy God. They presumed upon His grace. They were under no obligation to give anything. They could have kept a part of it back and been honest with what they gave. But you see, they wanted to be seen to give all that they had while secretly holding something back. And so they lied. And let's make no mistake, God killed them. Don't ever say God doesn't care about a little white lie. The righteous God of the universe struck them down, and in an instant, the result was the fear of God spreading all throughout the church. This was in the New Testament. We serve a holy God. And contrary to what many would have you believe, you don't just get to approach God any way you choose. You approach God as He requires. This is why there's a debate over how we worship. Silly, godless men worship with fog machines. Those who take God serious ask the question, how does God desire and deserve to be worshipped? And that's what we're going to do. Dear Christian, worship is not about you. It's not about your musical preferences. It's about a holy God who deserves to be worshipped. We need to do away with these stupid illustrations from the pulpit and dressing like you just walked out of the bedroom in the morning to come worship a holy God. Don't call me a legalist. You're just lazy and you don't know God. You'll dress up for a boss, for a workplace to go to, a bank to go to, a godless mall to look good for people who hate the God who saved you. You don't even give two thoughts about dressing reverentially. If you don't have a tie, don't wear a tie. But when you come in to the house of God, you're worshiping a holy God. And he deserves all the reverence you can give. Don't presume upon the goodness of God. We can approach God boldly as his children, yes, but humbly it must be. Because he is God and you are Lastly, the revelation of John. As 
some of you just learned that didn't have an S at the end. Again, if any disciple would have familiarity with God, you would think it might be John, the disciple who Jesus loved. But listen to how John responds to Christ. In Revelation 2, 12 through 18, it says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstand I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash and his head and his hair were like white like white wool like snow and his eyes were like flames of fire his feet were like burnished bronze and it had been made to glow in the furnace his voice was like the sound of many waters and having in his right hand seven stars and a sharp two-edged sword which comes out of his mouth and his face was like the sun shining in its power. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. There's enough people in here tonight that I guarantee some of you have never fallen on your face before God. And maybe you need to go home tonight and do that. But this is John. I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not fear. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever and have the keys of death and Hades. Do you see a pattern here? When people meet the living God, when they come and they encounter the resurrected Christ, the glorified Christ, they fall on their face. In fact, oftentimes they have to be told, do not fear. And we have Christians that have never, ever experienced the fear of God in their life once. And dear brother and sister, I call you that, but if you've never once had the fear of God in your life, you probably don't know God. And if you're confused, I'm telling you, you need to get saved. This was John, and it says he fell at his feet as though he were dead. Listen to Revelation 19, 12 through 15. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head there are many diadems having a name written on him, which no one knows except himself, and being clothed with the garment dripped in blood. For all the fools out there who believe in buddy Jesus, I have a wake-up call for them. Christ is coming back a conqueror and a king. And being clothed with a garment dripped in blood, his name is also called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the wrath of the rage of God, the Almighty. And, on, and he has on his garment and his name, and on his thigh name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Not Buddy Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords. Beloved, we worship the King of kings. And the Lord of Lords. Is that how you picture Christ? Yes, He's our precious Savior. Yes, He calls us friends, but He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The Puritans knew God. And because they knew God, they had a proper fear of God. Like the Puritans, I pray that we too would stand in awe and reverence when we come before a majestic and mighty God. The God who created all things, who, sus who sustains all things just by the power of His Word. He's a holy God who's all-powerful, who's all-knowing, who's all-present. He's the supreme ruler who reigns as the sovereign of the universe. He doesn't need anything. 
He's not want anything. He's not lacking anything. And yet, he chose to extend grace and mercy by creating the universe and mankind. And then bestowing upon man the greatest gift ever given. The possibility of relationship with God. If you were here tonight and you are not a Christian, I would plead with you, after being confronted with such a mighty and magnanimous God tonight who extends His grace freely to all, the who's, to all of those who would call on the name of Christ, turn from your sins, repent, and come to Christ. Now, this day, Acknowledge that you've sinned against an awesome and holy God. Understand that your sin against God deserves death and punishment, just like those in Noah's flood. And yet he offers salvation through Christ. Dear friend, if you don't know Christ, then I don't leave this building without repenting and falling at the foot of the cross and asking for mercy. Don't trifle with God, unbeliever. You've seen the God of Job who answers to no man, who controls all things. And so for the sake of your own soul, cry out to God. Look to Jesus Christ, confess him as Lord, and believe in your heart that he died to pay the penalty for your sin, and you will be saved from the wrath of God. Don't play with God. And some of you might think you're saved. And tonight, if you're honest with yourself, you may realize that you're not. You know that you're still living in sin and rebellion against God. Don't play with God if that's you, sir, ma'am. Repent of your sins and believe in Christ. And you, dear Christian, Brothers and sisters, you've been saved by grace through faith in Christ. Sent from God, whom we've met this morning through the pages of Scripture, don't leave here tonight treating God as casually as you have been. Don't you dare do that. You'll be held accountable for the knowledge of God you have, that you've been exposed to tonight. This God gave you life. Christ died for your sins, and when he returns in all his majesty and power and wonder, every knee will bow. He isn't buddy Jesus. He's the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Treat him as such, dear Christian. Don't play the fool with God. Stop treating Jesus like your best friend, sir. Jesus isn't your boyfriend, ma'am. He's God. And God is not like men. And he's not going to be treated like one. My prayer is that you leave here and you act as though you walk on holy ground when you approach God from now on. Because you do. And let that knowledge change you. Let it conform you. Let it confront you. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life you inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. The blood of Christ. Stop trifling with God. You were saved with the blood of Christ. Father, there's no greater privilege 
that could ever be had than the privilege of being able to do what we're doing right in this moment, coming before a holy God. Father, help us to learn the lesson Job learned, that you are God and we are not. Father, stir our hearts to desire to worship you as you would desire to be worshipped and not the way we want to worship you. Father, help us look to Christ. Remind us that we were bought with the highest cost, the blood of Christ. And let us live in light of that truth.